Thank you guys for being here this morning and for celebrating our youth and as they move into adulthood with us. And this text this morning, I, I have to admit, I've not struggled with a text like I struggled with this one. Just because of what God put on my heart to say, some of the things that I wanted to communicate that are difficult, that are hard, and I want to say them in love. So let me just start with this. First, church, I love you. I'm grateful for you, for how you've entrusted to me this role, how you've entrusted leadership to me, and how you have taught me so much about discipleship, about what it means to flesh out theology outside of the PhD. So thank you for that. It has been a struggle just as much to learn from me as it is to teach. And so God, um, I'm just so, so grateful for God that he placed me here and has humbled me in a lot of ways. And I'm grateful for this church staff who has put up with me uh, in, in so many different ways. And you can just ask Brad if you need further clarification uh, about that. So thank you for being here. This morning I want to ask one question. So I only have one point. We have one question, one point. And the question is this. What does faithfulness to the kingdom of God look like? What does faithfulness to the kingdom of God look like? This morning, I want you to examine your heart. As we read this text in 2 Timothy, as we think about our life, as we think about the legacy, the things that we've entrusted to our children, the things that we hope we entrust to them, ask yourself this question. Is my life in the present a testimony to the faithfulness of Jesus. No matter the circumstance, no matter the issue at hand, is my life a testimony of faithfulness? That is the question that I think Paul is urging for Timothy to examine. It's the question that I think Paul would ask of us today, church. And really this text, we, we pick up where Chris left off last week and it's just a continuation of what Paul is saying here to Timothy to guard what he's been entrusted with. If you back up to verse 13, he says, you know, retain the standard of sound teaching. That word sound means healing, as if you were putting a bone back into place. That's what it means to guard sound doctrine. So what does that look like? Well, Paul helps us here. He helps us see a contrast between the unfaithful and the faithful. So he's telling young Timothy, a young pastor, I'm going to move this because I'm not going to sit down. He's telling a young pastor, be faithful. Be faithful. And in his exhortations, he tells Timothy, stand guard. Why would he tell him that? I'm not going to read all the scripture this morning because we're pressed for time. But he tells him in verses 15 through 18, stand guard because... Phygelus, Hermogenes, they've walked away. Why would they walk away? Why have they deserted you, Paul? He doesn't tell us specifically. But the word that he uses for deserted is a very interesting word. It means doctoral apostate. That means for some doctoral reason, for some reason of doctrine, these two who were once with Paul walked away. How could that happen? How could that possibly happen? Well, he warns them. See, this is not the same situation as in uh, chapter 4 where Demas walks away from Paul. This is strictly about theology. Something happened to them. They could no longer hold the faith. They could no longer stay strong in this faith, and they had to walk away. Church, we have one mission. Just one. Faithfulness. Faithfulness is the mission of the church. Now, under that, there's a whole slew of things. There's a whole slew of things that we could talk about, what it means to be faithful, what it means to not be faithful. But today, I want to examine what pulls us away from faithfulness. It's not what you think. It's not what you think. Paul is telling young Timothy, hold on to the doctrines I've given you. I've walked with you, Timothy. I've entrusted these things to you. And now it's your time to lead. Now it's your time to pastor, to shepherd. And you're going to face temptations, things that you would never thought you'd deal with. How will you remain? How will you stand firm? Will you stand firm? 
I think that's a question that Paul has in the back of his mind. Will you keep this? Will you be faithful to the church? Will you be faithful to shepherd? And I can just see Timothy. I can see this young man who's probably in his 30s. These ideals of ministry floating around. Man, it's going to be like this. There's, these things are going to happen. I'm going to teach this doctrine. I'm going to teach this. And people are going to respond and they're going to love it and they're going to eat it up. And Paul, you just kind of see Paul as an old man saying, yeah, that's, that's great. Good luck to you, buddy. I love you. But he gives them a sobering reality. You know what, Timothy? People are going to walk away from you. You're going to do the right things. You're going to say the right things. You're going to love on people. You're going to entrust. You're going to be faithful to them. They're not going to want to hear it. They're going to walk away. How could this happen? How could this happen inside the fold? Remember, he's not talking about stuff outside the church. He's not talking about culture outside the church. He's talking within the fold. These are people that, who have walked with Paul, who have heard sound teaching. You can't get a better pastor teacher than Paul. But they've walked away. So what happens? What does all this mean? I think there's one drawing force that pulls people away. And it's idolatry. Right, hold, on, hold, on, hold on. I don't have any wooden figurines setting up on my mantle. I'm not worshiping Baal. You know, I'm not sacrificing goats in my living room. I'm not, I don't worship idols. What are you talking about? I don't think that's what Paul was talking about to them either. I think he's talking about the subtle, small changes that we make in our thinking, in our theology, that have huge implications for how we live our lives. It's like a little laser pointer, right? You make a small adjustment here, and trajectory changes a mile. That's how theology works. That's how reading works. As we experience things, our thinking changes. You see, Israel had this issue of idolatry over and over and over again throughout the Old Testament. I just see this pull and struggle of idolatry upon their hearts. It wasn't that they wanted something bad. In fact, many a times the idol is centered around something good, something worthy of their time and attention, but yet it pulls them away from God. Because we think about idolatry, we think about it as in these little wooden figurines that they put up and they worship them. And yeah, that's a part of it. But the essential driving force was two things. They wanted security and they wanted significance. They wanted to be like other nations. They said, God, why can't I have these things? I look, at, I look at the crops over here of the Canaanites and they're growing. I look at their infrastructure. It's growing. Their armies are strong. Why can't we have that, God? Why can't we have a king? God, don't, don't you care about us? Don't you want us to be secure? Don't you want us to be financially sound? And God would say, yeah, of course. Those are all good things. The problem is, Israel, the problem is, church, your heart. You see, you want those things more than you want me. And so what happens is when you pray, you don't get it, you shift. Your theology shifts a little bit and a little bit more and a little bit more until we're no longer faithful. You see, it's a heart issue. So what keeps us from being faithful? It's idolatry. All right, got you, dragon. But what does idolatry look for us? What does it look like for us as a church? I think in many ways, church, it's that we're pursuing greatness at the cost of goodliness. We pursue a lot of great things, right? We pursue wonderful things in ministry. And you can just see over and over and over again, different churches, different scenarios where they just want to do something great, right? Is that wrong? No. But what happens is we put fruitfulness over faithfulness, right? How does that happen? How did that creep in? Jim Collins wrote a book. From Good to Great. Anybody read it? It's usually on every pastor's shelf. Uh, I think Chris has it on his shelf for you, I agree. You read it? Well, in the book, <laughs> don't, don't have to worry about reading it. 
In the book, he talks about how if we want to shape our businesses, we have to go from good to great. And what we do is we take different people and put them in different seats on the bus, and he has this analogy. And so what happens is pastors look at that and say, yeah, that's, that's a great model. That's a great business model. Why can't I use that and then put it into a church context? And now I'm going to grow my leaders, my church. We're going to go from good to great. And I say that's a noble effort. I say that's a noble desire. It's a worthy desire. But at what cost? At what cost to the church? At what cost to families? At what cost to leaders, to volunteers? Tim Suttle wrote a book called Shrink. And in this, he critiques Jim Collins' method and the psychology of it. And he says, actually, greatness can be the enemy of goodness. Greatness can be the enemy of goodness. So families, mom and dad, how does that apply here? How does that apply to raising families in pedal? I have to say, I, I think most of us, most of us, the struggle, the idolatry that we hold resol- revolves around family, revolves around how we worship our family. What do you mean by that? Is that wrong? Just hang on with me. Don't throw any hymnals. I don't, we don't have hymnals yet, so just don't throw anything at me. What I mean by that is we want our children to be successful. Any parent not, doesn't want their children to be successful? No. We all want that for our children. We want our children to thrive and to do good. And so what happens? We push them, right? We push them into every different area. They have to be great in this. And we start testing our children in the third grade. In the third grade. We're pushing all this stuff on our kids. All this anxiety creeps up about the third grade. They start worrying about standardized tests. They start worrying about what they look like. They start worrying about, am I good enough? Do I compare to this person? And all these insecurities start pounding on and pounding on. And what happens? They start falling apart. But if we're not careful, church family, we can start rationalizing. Because we want our kids to be successful, because we want our business to be successful, because we want this, because we want that, we can rationalize our way away from faithfulness. And that's Tim Settle's point in his critique of Collins. You see, there was this huge psychological experiment done by Dan O'Reilly. And he, what he did was he, on college campuses across the U.S., he went and he said, okay, look, this is what I want to do. I'm going to pay every student $5.00 for every right answer you get on this test. So there's questions, about 30 questions. For every question you get right, I'm gonna pay you $5. But you're gonna grade your own test. You're gonna grade your own test. And so I'm gonna pay you, depending on what your grade is, you're gonna grade it. And so there's this shredder at the end of the room. So grade your test, shred it, and then tell me how much to pay you. What they didn't know was that the shredder was rigged. And so they weren't actually shredding the test. And so the psychologist could get it and they could score and see how much really, uh, how many people were actually cheating. So guess how many people stole a lot of money? Less than 5%. Guess how many people lied about one or two answers? 98%. The people that took or lied about everything, they only stole $150. The 98% stole $36,000. See, we don't, we don't even think about that. We don't think about $5. We don't think about... Nobody in this church, I think, would steal $5 if it was laying on the counter, right? But if there's a soda on the counter most of us wouldn't think twice about taking it. Why do I say that? I say that because God cares more about our character. He cares more about our faithfulness, our steadfastness, than he cares about our successfulness. So students, graduates, seek virtue. Mom and dad, seek virtue. Sow virtue into their lives. The degrees, all that stuff is great. Being successful is great. There's nothing wrong with that biblically. Nothing. Job was a very successful man financially. There's no critique of that. 
No critique of him being, being wealthy. The issue is always whether or not you are faithful with what God has given you. Are you faithful with your mind? Are you faithful with your heart, with your time? That's what God is concerned about. So let's go back into our text. We'll start in chapter 2. He says, there, You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is Jesus Christ. The things which I have heard, you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these things to faithful men whom will be able to teach others. And then Paul goes on to give four great analogies that we won't have time to get into. And he ends by saying, Remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, descendant of David, which suffered which I have suffered hardship, even imprisonment as a criminal. And he ends by saying, he is faithful. Even if we are faithless, he remains faithful. So let's back up. I've had the honor of thinking about discipleship, wrestling with discipleship. What what does that mean for us? What does that mean in the American church uh, for the past four and a half, five years? And really begin to flesh that out once I got here. I think that what I was doing in Vancouver, what I was doing in college ministry before all that, it was great. It was okay. But it's totally different when you're talking about discipling families. It's, it's a totally different dynamic when you're talking about discipling somebody with two small kids, discipling somebody in their 50s, right? Those are totally different time commitments. So this passage of Scripture is very dear to my heart. And there's so much that I want to talk about, but I'm, I'm trying to summarize a lot of what Paul is saying here. So he's saying make disciples. But if you notice, neither Paul nor Jesus in their command to make disciples tells us how. And I think that's for a good reason. Because if he gave us a list of five things, we would just do those five things and move on. It's an all-encompassing task. It includes conversion. The process of discipleship starts as a child and goes all the way to death. That's the process of discipleship. There's no one, two, three, four, five tier. It's your entire life. And either you're being a disciple of Jesus or you're being a disciple of culture. So the exhortation to us, we have a personal responsibility to entrust, to guard what has been given to us, church. To pass it on to our children, to pass it on to our coworkers, and please hear and learn from my mistakes I've made discipleship so much about the head, so much about learning, so much about books and reading, and I've put so much hardship on the people that have been in my groups. And what I've learned here is just to let go of some of that, to let go. Not that teaching people scripture or going deep, those things are not bad. Those are good things, and I'm going to encourage you in that in a minute. But first and foremost, discipleship is about time. It's about time. Because that is the most costly thing that you can give somebody is your time. And to sit with someone week after week, day after day, month after month, and to listen to them, to shepherd their heart, to guide them, that takes a lot of cost. It's a suffering of the mundane. We don't really think about it that way. But discipleship is suffering the mundane with somebody else. To walk faithfully with them to see you go through suffering, to see you go through pain, and to watch you consistently either go to Scripture, go to God, go to prayer, or go to something else. Eugene Peterson, the pastor and the guy that made the message translation, he wrote a lot of other really great books, by the way, so if that's the only thing you know him for, I would encourage you to read some of his other stuff. But he wrote a book on discipleship, and he called it this, Long obedience in the same direction. That's what discipleship is. And yes, we have a blueprint that I hope you will use. Yes, we've thought deeply about that and we want to help you with that. But know this, it's about this word. It's about entrusting this to each other, sharpening each other in the word, holding it up before each other and saying, how are you doing in this? Are you living this? Are you trusting in this? And watching it unravel over time but parents what does that mean for me what do do I do as a parent how do I disciple my children how do I disciple a teenager I don't know yet I have no idea what it means to disciple a teenager I'm just going to be up front I have some ideals in my head about what that looks like 
and I have some principles from men who have been there and who have walked faithfully through some very difficult seasons. And I think it happens in five to ten minutes a day. Five to ten minutes a day. I don't know about you, but there are some days we are literally driving down the road and I'm throwing chicken nuggets at Ella and Ollie in the back seat, right? Anybody else have that issue? It comes, it comes to quiet time. It comes to our bedtime for the kids. We put them down. They're squirming around. You're like, good Lord, please just be still. I'm trying to tell you something. I'm trying to teach you something. They're squirming around. The questions are flying off the wall. And you're like, I, I don't know if you got anything. But the point of it is, I'm just trying to entrust the gospel into them five to ten minutes at a time. Or if that's in the car as you're going from the next event, whether that's uh, at dinner time, whatever it is. There's so much pressure on you. So much pressure on you, parents. Let me, just, let me just speak a word of grace over your life. If you try, if you try to entrust the gospel to your children, if you try to be faithful, if you try to entrust this word to them, I believe that God will bless it. You say, I don't know, you haven't seen my teenager. You haven't seen how, well, just hold on. Just wait. The story's not over yet. Church, if you could see my life, and I'm glad you can't, if you could see my life 10, 15 years ago, it looked radically different. I wasn't raised in a Christian home. My mom and dad didn't entrust this word to me. They left. But I had one example of faithfulness, my grandmother. She didn't know theology. She played the piano in the church. But she prayed for me every night. You know, I still remember those prayers. Some of them. And I remember that. And when God took her away, when I was 15, I struggled really hard with God. But I remembered her prayers. I remembered her faithfulness. And so I, I hung on. I wrestled with it. And God placed men in my life to let me wrestle, to let me struggle with those deep questions. Nobody thought 15-year-old Josh would ever become a pastor. 15-year-old Josh would have said, no way. I would have said some other things. No way. 19-year-old, 20-year-old Josh would have said, no way, there's no way I would ever teach this book. Because of my shame, because of my past, there's no way. So parents, if you've given up hope, just keep sowing faithfulness. Just as you look at me on the stage, know that it's not too late. If they have breath in their lungs, if you have breath in your lungs, it's not too late. Keep sowing faithfulness. Dads, they need you. Specifically the dads. And it is your duty to entrust this word to your children and to your wife. And I feel very strongly about this because I think as men, we tend to stink at it. Women naturally are just really great teachers. And even my wife has to correct me sometimes in our small, she's like, baby, he, they don't understand that. You're gonna have to you know, readjust. They don't, we're not ready to talk about widows yet. Let's just, let's just move on. Like women, I, you guys get it. You understand the importance of this. You, you know how to teach better than we do. But the point is, God has designed the family. He wants the man to lead. Why? Because we tend to check out. We tend to leave. When things get hard, we run. I watched it happen in my father. I see those seeds in myself. Dad, it's your job to initiate small time. It's your job to initiate prayer, to lead. I don't always succeed in that, I admit. But I know it's my responsibility and I know it's your responsibility. Don't put it off on your wife. Second thing, tell a better story. So five to ten minutes a day. And second thing, tell a better, better story. There are two narratives in our culture, right? The narrative in culture is faster, better, stronger. All those things are greater. And then the narrative we see in Scripture is meekness, humbleness, patience. All of those virtues of the gospel that we hope our children embody. And these two narratives are always clashing with one another, right? 
as they go off into college, they start to wrestle with these narratives in a very different way. So mom and dad, grandpa, grandma, tell a better story. Understand this book. Seek to know the stories that are in there. Because a lot of times we grow up, and I did, I grew up on Disney, right? Anybody else grow up on Disney? We all did. What is, this, what is the narrative Disney tells? Do the right thing, you get rewarded. The guy always gets the girl. The princess always has a savior and a man. All those narratives. But then we get into the real world, and none of that seems to flesh out. What happened? That's just reality. I want to see the Disney movie about the hero doing the right thing and then he gets punished. Because that's life. Because culture says, you know what? If you have to cheat a little bit, it's okay. We've all done it. Just, just take a, skim a little bit off the top. You deserve it. You've earned it. Businessmen, you've seen it. I've heard one guy say it this way. Ethics are costly. The more ethics that you hold, the more it's going to cost you. The same with the gospel. The more that you hold to the gospel, the more it's going to cost you. Maybe not your life, but certainly your money and certainly your time. So parents, help us. Help your children. Help your grandchildren see that it's worth to be faithful. It's worthy to be faithful. And that in itself is the reward of the gospel. Not that you're going to be celebrated because you won't. That's not the narrative that our culture says will be celebrated. Those who are faithful. No, we celebrate success. We celebrate fruitfulness. And those things aren't bad. Don't hear me saying that they're bad. But they are when they come at a cost. And especially for a Christian, if you're sacrificing faithfulness, So what are some examples of in our church? And I was thinking about this. There's so many great missionaries that we look to, so many of these success stories that we look to, and they're all great and grand. But I think about the widows of our church. I think about the older men who I watch serve quietly, patiently, week in and week out. Nobody knows. Nobody sees them. Let me just say we see. Your pastoral staff sees and you are our heroes. I won't name names because I don't want to embarrass anybody. But I've just been humbled by some of the older men in this church, by the widows of this church who have come up to me and said, I'm praying for you. And I know of, without a shadow of a doubt, they are. You're my hero. You're the person that I hope to emulate. Someone who's been faithful over a long period of time. Not someone who just knows a lot of stuff. So what if you're smart? So what if you're, you know, successful at a young age? Show me someone who's been faithful over 50, 60 years of marriage. Those are my heroes. That's the man I want to be. So mom and dad, what are you modeling? What do you model? What do you push? What narrative do you push to your children? These are things that we have to think about. Because it's one thing to say, yeah, I want you to go to church. I want you to love Jesus. I want you to submit your life to this. But if there's a dissonance between what you say and what you do, dad, mom, we're not going to hear it. And I heard my parents say the same thing. As they walked in unfaithfulness and told me to be faithful, I said, there's no way I'm going to do that. And I didn't. So let my life be a warning to you. If there's a distance between what you say and what you do, you're in trouble. So lastly, i got to hurry up. Remember, remember the faithfulness of Jesus. Why does he tell Timothy this here? Why does he tell him to remember the faithfulness of Jesus? Remember, he's a young pastor. He's maybe just starting out. He's got all these ideals. But life's about to happen. It's about to get real. When Paul passes away, he's on his own. 
and all the things that Paul has faced, all the things that he knows Timothy will face are coming. He says, remember Jesus. Can I just confess something? It doesn't matter if you're a pastor or not. Sometimes we doubt. Sometimes we don't feel like being faithful. We understand that struggle. We do. We don't live in this little holy bubble where we always feel optimistic, successful, that you've heard us, that you're listening to us. In fact, ministry, if you wanted to describe pastors in a word, it's probably depression. Realist, I'm being serious. Most pastors are depressed, cynical, beat down, and that's where they live most of the time. So we understand life is painful. And we've watched you and we walk with you through those different seasons of your life. But here's the question about that. When pain comes, when suffering comes, when abuse happens, when hurt happens, how do you respond? How do you respond? But here's, listen, if you failed, if you haven't been faithful, you say, my whole life is a mark of unfaithfulness. Here's the good news. Here's the gospel. Here's how the gospel speaks to you, to me. It doesn't depend on you. Church, it does not depend on you. The successfulness of the church does not depend on your faithfulness. And that's really great news. Look at the life of Moses. 40 years, 40 years of faithfulness is blown by what? One mistake. One mistake. He told him to speak to the rock, he struck the rock. You think, man, that's just unfair. That's really unfair. But it's all, all it takes is one mistake. You can lose your wife, you can lose your kids. But what do we do? When that happens, what do we do? We turn to Jesus. We turn to him. We look to his blessings. Notice that even amidst all the failure that's happening, the moral failure, especially within pastoral ministry in the SBC, notice that God hasn't stopped blessing his church. He doesn't say, well, there's some failure. I'm done. I'm checked out. No. I'm still faithful to you. I still love you. And so even as we fail, even if we live our whole lives in faithlessness, God will still be faithful to his church because it doesn't depend on us. And that is the gospel. And that what is what Paul is telling Timothy to base his ministry and his life upon. And that's what I'm telling you to base your life on. Put your hope and trust in this word that it, it, God is faithful to it. So as we come to now to a time of closing, I don't know where you are. I don't know your life experiences. I don't know what you're struggling with this morning. But I know this, we all struggle with faithfulness. And there's something in your life, some idol, something worthy, something great probably, but it's robbing you of goodness. So I'm asking you quite literally this morning to lay it down. As the band comes and we sing and we worship God in song, will you lay it down this morning? Will you literally lay an idol down on this altar? Will you step foot forward and say, God, I want to trust you more. I'm struggling with something. I have an issue in my life that I need to resolve. God, I want to take a step of obedience toward that. Because here's what happens, church. A right choice, a good decision, good decision leads to another good decision. A bad decision leads to another bad decision. And we see that in Paul's logic. We see that in Romans. So make a good choice this week. Make a good choice today to serve, to worship, and trust God. No matter if he's answered your prayers, no matter if he's done anything good for you this week in your eyes. Will you pray with me?